Ever want to know why the creation of the Noisy Chair happened? Well, people wanted to share their story, concerns, and being loud. Well, I'm here to listen, have an opinion, and talk to people. That's what this is all about. My name is Dave, a.k.a. DJ Dave. Love being part of a new journey with amazing people on my podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Noisy Chair Podcast, Season 2, Episode 207. I'm your host, DJ Dave. And with me is legendary OG of the New York's DJs. Please welcome Lenny Fontana. Lenny, thanks so much for coming on board tonight. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me. Oh, listen, it's uh, I've been trying to get a hold of you on that. I know you're a busy man, and and uh, and uh, you're on the other end of the interview. You're being interviewed before you <laughs> you were doing all the interviewing, which is kind of cool. So. Um, Listen, I'm, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're here and it's an honor to have you as uh, as one of my guests tonight um, I guess you just came back from Europe DJing at the end of October lots of I did lots of gigs in April I did lots of gigs in the summer and then I went back in uh, September I did uh, vocal booth weekender okay and then vocal booth weekender. That's run by another DJ named Andy Ward. And he goes on this, the name Soul Central back in the day with that big hit on Defected. Right. So he had asked me when I came to do the, um, the weekend event because it was started Thursday and ended pretty much on Tuesday. Um, and English people do that a lot. They'll book places where they do Southport Weekend of Croatia. I know all of you have seen that. Uh, Defected on Croatia, Sunsea Beat. All those type of events are over a few days. So he does something called Vocal Booth Weekend there. Okay. He invited myself, Maurice Joshua, Eric Cupper, and he wanted to do something special for this particular one since it was a while since I had been back. Right. And also some of the internationals that were there. So he asked me, would I bring True House Stories there to do a live talk the following day after I played? I said, yeah. It was the first time actually we would ever did True House Stories on location to a full room. So I took the show and basically set up kind of like a panel. I had let Victor Simonelli begin, spoke a bit, then had Eric Cupper, um, excuse me, then I had Maurice Joshua from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Those that know Maurice Joshua, he went on to produce for Beyonce and That's right. many remixes. You know, he's a Chicago legend himself. Mm -hmm. We had Eric Cupper, we had another Sun, we had also Sun Square Live from Italy, Claudio Passavanti. He spoke as well. So what I did was I did what I normally do, speak a little bit, and then I let them speak about their lives, recap how they came up in the business and stuff. Right. So that went quite well. The gigs were really great. <laughs> I have I can't say I've been on any really bad gigs. Every gig has been really good because everyone was ha clamoring to come back out. Everyone's happy to come back. Just happy was, to come back. That's exactly what it was. And then yeah. I went and did that. That was September. I came back home to New York. Then I went back to Amsterdam Dance Event, did two gigs there. Uh, and then I played at Paloma in Berlin for eight hours. Wow. Eight nice. Hours, which is nice because that's like old school way. You so, know it. Yeah. So between all the gigs throughout the summer – the gigs and I, I just got. I have nothing but a lot of love and thankfulness and gratefulness. Because I'm always grateful. Thank, thankfully, that I'm mm -hmm. accepted as still to this day playing as long as I've been playing in the game. Right, right. And still making you know the records and all. So that story, yeah. how that all went so far. Are there clubs or venues that have sort of closed down because of and not reopened because of the COVID? You know, some things went away. Mm -hmm. um, some promoters went away too. 
Right. So <laughs> that's, that's really, really what I think it's more of which promoters came back. I see mm -hmm. Benny Soto's back. Like Mike Nervous and Benny does not. I mean, I had him on my show. We talked. Right. Yeah. Um, again, the clubs are back. It's just a matter of maybe they're a little bit more selective in what they're doing. Right. Manhattan is missing the scene. Okay. Brooklyn has all the clubs. <clears throat> But Manhattan as, as a whole, like the being the mecca of what it always was, is not there. And somebody may curse me out and say, what is he talking about? Well, <laughs> there is particular parties going on, mm -hmm. but it's not like it used to be where there was clubs everywhere. As uh, as DJs, do we find that since prices went up, do we, you know, have have, you know, rates of DJs have gone up as well when they do parties? And gigs? Well, you know, it depends. I mean, you, you know, I talk to promoters on the top end. These guys are charging a lot more. Mm -hmm. On the low end, they're fighting to get these jobs. Right. And undercutting. So it's going both ways. Yeah. You yeah, know, it is. And who it is. And, you know, you hear, you're hearing all kinds of stuff. I mean, I've, yeah, been, no, we... I've been very busy. But mm -hmm. I have to say, I have had to work probably as hard as everybody else to get it's just a lot of us out there, and there's not that many, many gigs. Right. If they actually or the clubs are paying more for DJs now, or are they just trying to get them in and get people in and just fill up the areas? Uh, you know, Carl Cox and that and those particular A guys, they charge pre to COVID a lot. So the question is, these clubs will take no risk by bringing them in knowing that they will pack it so they'll pay that money. Right. Or right. within or within what they're asking. Maybe they'll of you know course. negotiate because they know of if course. you bring them in, they're gonna yeah. they won't get what they expect. Right. So right. it's a business, you know, and I try to explain to everybody, it's a business. You can't take it personal. When was the last time you've been to Toronto? I yeah. love Toronto. Toronto's an awesome city. Do you foresee yourself like in the future? Do you have plans to come up here for for anything at the moment? Well, it's funny. I was talking to the people from BPM. Okay. And they're involved with somebody up there in Toronto. We're trying to organize some dates. So I'll, oh, let, man. You know, I'll let you know. Yeah, Philip Turturro, for sure. Philip Turturro is it's BPM. We were talking about it. I was supposed to see mm -hmm. him in ADE, but he got really sick. And we were talking about coming up for Toronto. I'll be up there. It's been yeah, a while, but I'd love to come. I, I come tomorrow. <laughs> Toronto has the right; it's got the right situation. Yeah, for sure. Can you can you travel? Do you get your passport all sorted? Up? Obviously, you did because you well, went to Europe. Yeah, I've been going. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, Toronto's <laughs> easy. That's like going to Jersey <laughs> for me. Uh, going to Europe and the rest around the world. Yeah, everything's fine on my end as far as traveling. I'm already been past that. My first gigs actually. The first gig I did this year was January. That okay. felt strange because the the I had to go to Tenerife to play, and mm -hmm. th with the lockdown, and everything it was still very strict. I was worried about what happens if I get sick. Can right. I get back? This was freaking me out because we were still. I don't know if I want to do this anymore now. Gotcha. You know, the whole thing was just, look, it, COVID's it, a mother, mother effer. You know I mean? You're like, <laughs> you're like it, you know, yeah, you're right. It makes it, you crazy. It, it makes your mind go in, in crazy modes and, it and made thinking me about want things. To leave the house. I didn't want to leave. I was like, afraid. I'm like, I was like, I'm traveling again. Oh my God, this is crazy. Like all that, <laughs> the, I couldn't even figure out how to do it again. Like, we dreamed about it, but it was like, I'm actually going somewhere. Right. Yeah. And it was bizarre, <laughs> but it was great. I Those remember when you did. were not that great because they had such restrictions at the club. You could only let like, normally let's say you had 500 people. They allowed 75 people. And so it looked right. empty. It was horrible. <laughs> I and know. It was, like, it was horrible. I was like, this sucks. Yeah. I know. I know. It did my head in. 
I was trying to work around it. I, I got past it. I still worked and did all my thing. And good. I hate it no more. You know, you just deal with it. But that was the first coming back out. April was awesome because the restrictions were lowered. I went to play in London. All the DJs came to see me. It nice. was it was nice. It felt really good. What a great feeling. You know, everybody yeah. came out in attendance to see me. We hugged, we laughed. Yeah. It felt like it was like kind of like the, the thought. Look, put it like this. Let's <laughs> let's get into that thought process. The war ended, and and you're seeing everybody again. Yeah, that's right. That's how it felt. And ADE Amsterdam dance event felt the same way like that too because I saw more people this past time, and that was a good feeling. You know, so good. Oh my god. What a great feeling. Now, do you find that, you know, the style of music you play, you're getting all types of ages coming in, like, you know, us old school to the to the younger generations? Do you find them coming in and enjoying your music? Oh, yeah. I tell you what, you get all age groups now coming out mm -hmm. from really young to an older crowd. Right. I have no problem playing to any of them. Awesome. The board and they enjoy it. it depends. I put myself in a position where I can read my crowd. Mm -hmm. I know what they want. Right. And I'm ready for it. So if I'm coming in there with that mindset, I know how I'm going to program my evening. You know, if it's going to gotcha. be different disco feel or is it going to be me playing like a full across the board set, I'm going to work through the night. Depends on how many yeah. hours I get, too. Yeah, I mean, especially eight hours. If you're playing eight hours, I mean. Well, that's uh, not often. It's not often I get to play that amount of hours. Yeah, but you're you're throwing everything in there, like a lot of different, you know. Shit, I could take you on a good journey. Good Yeah, tour. man. Did you ever record that? Did you record that eight-hour set yes, at all? Actually, it's on SoundCloud. It's on the Lenny oh, Fontana. Man. It's um live at Paloma, Berlin. It's really cool. Oh, I gotta, I, I gotta, I'm gonna post that link up on the, on that if you don't it's mind. It's really cool. I, it's not often I get to do something like that. And they sent me the recording after. I was like, wow, this is super cool. Because I was telling my, my business partner Manuel, he was with me in Berlin, and I said, it'd be, I wish we were recording this. And then I get home, and they sent me a message. Says, oh, by the way, we recorded the set. And I went, really? You recorded? <laughs> wow. Because normally they tell you. They're not supposed to record the set unless they. Right. Nobody told me anything. There was no recorder there. <laughs> they recorded. <laughs> they set me the full eight hours set. Man, it was worth oh, it. Man. It gives you a representation of, of my musical pedigree and the style I like to play. Absolutely, the the, the storytelling of of your music. Yeah. You know, you were born and raised in New York City. Totally, I'm a New York man. My blood runs New York red. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. The big family growing up? Yeah, I have um, my younger sister and my younger brother. Awesome. The three of us. Yep. Okay. Who influenced you in, into music? I got to give credit to my grandmother. She's no longer here. Um, she wanted me to play piano. So it starts at age six piano so i become classically trained nice. because of that awesome now mind you so in my okay. house frankie crocker on wls new york radio 107.5 was on mm -hmm. the radio and he was what you call a drive time radio dj i grew up with that around me frankie crocker was a big influence um musically speaking mm -hmm. and as disco started to become a mainstay or should i say dance music he also was playing that music too before it even became huge the mm -hmm. disco craze we're talking the mid 70s you know right. all the way i was gonna say yeah yeah, so uh, that was what was going on in my life. I'm listening to all that music, and that's how I was able to get to where I am today. Look, 
let's say in the early 70s, I remember taking a pretend microphone and <laughs> not a microphone, <laughs> uh, an antenna, taking <laughs> it and having these big headphones and, and pretending I was DJing, not DJ mixing, radio DJ. Right. Not realizing, you know, not realizing if I'm doing anything right or wrong, just imagining what I would thought a DJ be doing. Yeah. You know, and playing Al Green, Let's Stay Together. I remember <laughs> Isaac Hayes, I was playing these records on a garage turntable. Garage. Right. Garage right. turntable. Okay. <laughs> we all did that, man. We all did that. All had that opportunity pretending we were radio DJs, being the one talking and and you know, dude, I wasn't going out music. to know David Mancuso loft yet. I wasn't old enough to do any of that yet. <laughs> the only club I went to was called Pillows and Sheets in my bedroom. That was my club. You know, I mean, there was no, there was no, nothing, no zero like that. No. But I can say, my mother had a party in the projects because we lived in like in a. Uh, council housing at that time mm -hmm. my father yep. became a stockbroker it was, it was not it was kind of like the projects and we had this black couple down the hall ronnie and darlene he was a police officer and darlene and him were hustling and this is in the mid-70s i never seen hustling for it and they were talking about that they were going to this club in manhattan called the gallery and they were hustling for whatever reason, I heard all these names. They stuck with me. Later, as I got older, it hit me when I, I was hanging out. And Nikki Ciano in the gallery you mentioned, I went, oh, my God, that's where they went dancing. And that's where I saw them hustling. And I put everything together later on. But because I, I was remembering all that stuff. Right, right. It's crazy. You know, and of course, did I ever dream that I'd be friends with everybody years later? Yeah. Never at that time. But all this was going on like a microcosm in different parts yeah. of New York, and people were going out, coming back, and show. They showed us what they would, how they danced. It was awesome. They were spinning around. I was like, and I think if I was remember, they were playing uh, "Love Is a Me Not Love Is a Message," uh, OJ's message in our music, something like that, and they okay. were. And I was blown, blown away. Watch, I just sat there and watched, and I just wanted to be part of it, but didn't yeah. didn't know what what part I would ever be. My grandmother was just she used to say to me, "I want to see you in an orchestra." Well, I never went into orchestra; <laughs> went a whole different direction. But yes, I can conduct the orchestra now. But it's kind of funny. Thinking about it now, when you ask me, and I'm telling you this in a way, you know, super cool though. That is, that's, a, that's an amazing story. And you said it perfectly. You're a conductor of music right now with DJing. Pretty much. Or, you know, producing music or playing, or playing music. You're the conductor, you know, you're tell, and you're also a storyteller, you know, with music and people are just, eating it up and you're feeding off the vibe of the people and that's that's what keeps us going totally you know and and also life's experience has given me a whole different career in a sense that i've been able to share because of a dark period of covid forced mm -hmm. me into a position to become a talk show host in a sense yeah. like you do it is amazing to hear all these stories that nobody else would ever hear and and sharing that journey and sharing that story that's love that thank you i i love that leading up to the leading up to the days you know um of becoming a dj you know cuz you're you were surrounded by music of like the disco which really gravitated towards you but you're also you know in the bronx it was hip hop funk was there, and even rock and roll, you know, you sort of just gravitated to the disco, I guess, is what it was, correct? 100%. Mind you, don't forget, disco exploded in America. 
He did. You get away from you. it. Yeah. You went to McDonald's, you heard it. You heard it at Burger King. <laughs> you went to someone's party. You went on the street. Yeah. You heard it on Disco 92. You heard it on... It was, it was everywhere. It was everywhere. Everywhere. Up until 1980. And then right. it died right after. We all know the story of Comiskey Park and, you know, 79. And it bring bring your records to the Chicago game. And they wound up exploding the records. And what a mishmash. And then it was more against the gay and the blacks. It was a sad time. That was a sad time. You don't hear about you don't hear about that a lot though. Like it was sort of like a it was big at that point and it was very quiet and hush hush now. Well, because it reverberated around the world right, right after that happened. Yeah. Especially oh, it did. Especially in America. It was just yeah. like a curse word, disco. Went back mm-hmm. underground, to be honest. It never really died. It left that commercial level. Right. Mom and pop, you know, yeah, nonsense. Right. Let's say Frank Sinatra, Ethel Merman, Johnny <laughs> Mathis, all these people, Matt King Cole, they're all doing disco. Yeah. It's terrible. But that's what yeah, happens. That's yeah, right. when you get that exploiting, exploitation going on. You know, it gets to a point where record labels saw an advantageous moment to make such a killing. And they did, but it got to the point where they bastardized it. It was right. no longer good. Now it's ridiculous. It gets to a point where you go, "Ah, oh, I hate this," and the and and not me, but the pushback from people. For example, right. so you have people who are diehard rock people, diehard into Led Zeppelin at the time, and those mm-hmm. rock bands, Wings, whatever, Queen's Clearwater Revival, all that stuff. Yeah. All of a sudden, rock music used to be on the radio all the time. Disco happens, throw all the rock records out and bring disco on. And that's what happened. It got to the point where it was just too much. Too much, too fast because of Sinai Fever. But nobody understands how that Sinai Fever thing really took off. Really? Like, what do you mean? Like, how that, that whole movie, Sinai yeah. Fever? How it worked? Yeah, so, like, Robert tell Stigwood, us. so, Robert Stigwood, what he did yeah. was he said to Paramount Pictures, We're going to work a ballad song as the release, How Deep Is Your Love? If I could get that record to go number one in each state or whatever territory, you have to match me with promotion dollars for the movie. So he worked the record piece by piece. So how deep is your love hit number one in Cincinnati? Now they got to push the record. They got to push the movie in Ohio. And that's how that thing blew up. He went wow. with a ballad record. Ballad. Wow. The Bee Gees. Correct. Because the Bee Gees was his branding band. That would have happened. They went with a goddamn ballad. <laughs> That's true. Brilliant. A ballad. A ballad. Brilliant. I was going to say, brilliant marketing, branding, business. All in one shot. Amazing. Then you get the, then you get the back end. The thing blows up, Paramount's movie, because that movie was actually meant to be more for Greece, for Travolta to get the Greece part. Right. He signed on to do this three picture deal. He said, All right, I'll do it. And then the movie became a crazy, uh, went nuts. Yeah, phenomenon, like you said. But then you said that disco sort of, you know, went underground back in the 80s. Is that when typically. House came into play from the disco era of 1980. Let's be honest, before you could say house music, you had what they called RB dance, you had electro. Okay. You had so way before this, way before house even was mentioned yeah. as house. Yeah, because you know, there's so many great records from 1980 to before 84, 85, when house music started to show its head mm-hmm. that you know, think about this for a second. I talk to a lot of Chicago people. Right. And what were they influenced by? Italo disco. 
What is that? Italo Disco. Italo Disco. The piano tracks out of Italy. Think about this for a second, everyone. So in North America, disco became a disgusting word. So went back into the nightclubs and people were doing underground style records. But overseas, this the faster music never ended. It kept going. Mm. That music was still on the radio. People were still loving it. Here, it slowed down. You had new wave starting. You had what they called dance oriented rock. You had what you would have called disco would be more dance music or R and B dance music. Gotcha. It had more of that blacker sound to it. Yeah. Um. And then, of course, electro comes into play, which would be more of the stuff like what Arthur Baker did and Tommy Boy Records. Right. Uh, that time. So you would you would still categorize it as disco. But they didn't categorize as disco. They changed it to genres, to different types of genres. And that's how it formulated to go into house music came a little bit later. Tommy Boy Records, you mentioned his name. You had him on your show last Tom week. Tom Silverman. Yes. Great show. Great show. Great guy. Cool cat, man. Oh, my God. Tom is as down to earth mm-hmm. as I am. You know, we, and, and, he's, and he's, I mean, you have to think. Tom's been there through it, uh, through all of it, through the 70s, the 80s. Look at the stuff. You know, when you want to talk I- iconic, you want to talk right. about icon, that's an icon to me. Yeah. He yeah, no kidding. revolutionized and changed how we heard music. Amazing. Yeah, I, I totally believe you. I mean, and, and I think everyone should should watch your show and and check out the history back then with with time away records of what he went through and what he did for for us not just as djs but for music listeners and lovers of music but how to be done of course i mean i think he took he took a ton of chances back then you know a ton of chances i don't know how else to put it i mean you know like we laugh about it i said to him you got a five thousand dollar loan from your parents. Now he's really brilliant. He went to school, trained Christ to almost be like a rocket scientist. Comes out, <laughs> out two hundred resumes, and never gets a job in his field. Wow. And then he creates with two other friends a thing called Dance Music Report, an article every week where they would. You know, go out, interview the different people, and it started in the disco era, 1978. And then, you know, 1981, he creates Tommy Boy Records. In between, he's, he's involved in music seminar, all these great things. Amazing. So, you know, what are you doing? Does he realize <laughs> that he's changing things? No. You're in the middle of living it. You're just doing it. You don't right. think about what you're changing. You're just trying to Hey, let's make something better. Let's in, make things more informative for people. You know, you never think about it when you're in the middle of doing. You're thinking about how you're going to survive. How you're going to pay bills. You know, uh, along the way, like you said, I went to go see Arth, uh, that Arthur Baker, um, Africa Mbata. You mentioned. Okay. Yeah. I mean, think about this, Africa Mbata. Okay. Yeah. The last big rap record you had that was massive. Was Sugar Hill Gang, which Big changed time. at that time, 1979, 1980. Here he's coming along with with he, he meets up African Body, so somehow coerces him to go into a studio with him, spend money. He's never done this before to make a record, and he said to him, you know, from he went to go see him DJ and all that, and he was impressed by what he saw, what the crowd was into, and all that stuff. And it brought him to this level where he said, would you make a record with me? And they did. It was first record was Jazzy Sensation. Pretty right. cool. Not a massive hit. Mm-hmm. But not too long after. The record that changes everything once again, that sets him as now leader of this new school, will be Planet Rock. And from there, the rest is history. Read the book. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> read the book. On, I mean, you know, but but to hear him tell you himself right. the things that he was telling me on my show, which, which is why my show is is really becomes more like a music documentary. Is a lot of times when the people that I'm sitting with that I'm interviewing never spoke about any of this stuff anywhere. No so interviews. No, because a lot of times journalists are journalists. Right. In my show, you're hearing them speak. And I'm guiding them. You know, and I'm Amazing. blessed to remember a lot of the information because that helps for us to to have gather. a conversation. Yeah. To keep yeah, man. Engagement. Engagement's a big part, you know? You no, know, it um, is huge. Now, when you started the True House, True House Stories, did you were you sort of creating it more of like a podcast, like an interview, or you were your intentions were to say a couple things, engage with them, but let them tell you the story? Is that how you wanted to all perceive? Let me reenact the phone call, to Marshall <laughs> Jefferson. MJ, yo, what up, Lenny? <laughs> Dude. I want to try something. I just want to try to bring something to everybody. Would you come on if I did something where you tell a little bit about your life more so off the cuff than me giving you questions? He's like, yeah, you know, why not? And that's how it happened. It was more like, hi. I put the camera on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lenny Fontana, and welcome to our stories coming out of New York City. And tonight, or whatever it was, today I said, we have one of House Music's greats. And I explained who he is and what he did and how he did it. And then we brought him up and he said, man, I'm going to have you open up every time I go out somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear that from everybody. Whenever they come on my show, I hear the same. I hear, man, what an introduction. <laughs> you know, it makes my introduction look like crap. I mean, I'm, I'm listen, I'm new at this and I'm, I'm, I'm trying it all. Like I'm just, you know, I, I guess, I guess I don't know, you know, where this is going to go. Obviously it's more of like the, the sharing the journey is what I'm, what we're, you know, we're talking about. And to have that intro, like of how you just laid the intro down for these guys, and they're like, "Man, you know, you need to do this for me all the time." Hey, or, or, you know. that too. He's like, "Bro, <laughs> I love you. I know you forever." Hearing you talk about me, like Louis Vegas said the same thing about. I'm like, you know what? I learned that from Johnny Carson and watching David Letterman and all of them and all the greats on TV. That you know how they set them up. Right. How someone sets someone up gives the, okay. the the person, the audience, an idea of what's coming, you know? Mm -hmm. And my show is absolutely no punch list. My show is one question, and we take it from there. I ask only one question. You know, and I tell this every time. If you listen, if you watch the show, <clears throat> you'll, you'll hear me after the right. monologue start the show, and I'll say, how does music find you? DJ Dave as a young kid. And then I'll let you tell us your story. And yeah. I become the guide. So it gives a person a lot of Crazy. room to talk, really express. And I'll tell you, the formula works. Two and a half mm. years later, almost three. And we're going strong with some amazing, amazing interviews. And uh, Yes. I mean, I watched them, and and not all of them. I'm getting to it, but it, it, you're exactly right. You you just say one thing, ask him one question, and then they just open up to you, you know. But being but but having them open up to you, like you've most of them you've known on a friendship level growing up, correct? In the in the business. Well, that's what bothers everybody. Because they always write to me, fan mail. You have so many friends. <laughs> it's true. But here's the thing I tell everyone. They're not just 
friends we grew up with. We've worked together. We've toured mm -hmm. together. I've right. done records for their labels or whatever it could be. You know, yeah. We've hung together. I mean, yeah. we've been, you know, it, it you, so it's not like they're strangers to me. Right. So I'm this and again, I'll use David Morales as an example. In if you ever watch his interview, everyone, if you ever watch the interview, somewhere you're gonna hear that he's talking about his accolades. Hmm. And he's never spoken about this next part, which I'm gonna say. So of course, as the interview's going, I go, Dave, one Sunday morning, I open up my computer and in it says, from the, the, the Daily Sun in the UK, it says, international superstar DJ, arrested in asia and japan was that him that was david morales that happened to him really? and david basically stopped and took a pause and he was just like he goes after he paused he says i'm not going to answer it and then he goes about to tell the story about how it was in the jail <sighs> and what was going on and all that stuff. And he also said if it was a young kid that asked him the question, he probably would have stopped the interview. But because it was me, and our friendship mm -hmm. and all that he was compelled to have to answer it so i respected it and that's why that show that i have true house stories stands on its own two feet because those are the type of things that we we get deep in Deep down, I mean, I've heard some, the best interview should have gave, I should get an Emmy Award for it. <laughs> the best interview with tears and all. The best one, tell to me, this day is DJ Sneaks. Really, when I put up that I was bringing Sneak on, I got hate mail. You have no idea. Are you serious? Because the people in England were like. They were just not having him. They didn't understand why he is the way he is, why he's angry, and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. I told everybody the days before I was leading up to. I said, "Trust in me. I will bring you to understand why Sneak is who he is. Right, and he's going to tell you all. Do you know at the end of that interview, Sneak has said it so many times that he has." Somehow, do this interview, not his credibility, but he's been able to get his honor back. To me, that was wow. exactly why I wanted to do his interview. And I'm so proud to be part of that, to turn something around that was pretty much a thing where you would say he's not looked at in the right light to like people who start to turn their cheek to say he's actually a really good guy. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, he's a very good guy. It's just unfortunate he's too honest sometimes. People don't want to hear honesty, you know? One of the best. I mean, so many. Danny Teneglia. I mean, all of them. Louis Vegas. Every, this, everybody Man. has something that they bring. There's experiences involved. Right. There's yeah. health that issues. No, some. Yeah, that nobody, that no one knows, you know? That nobody knows in the world, right? I didn't know that DJ Sneak had a lash at with, with, you know, in England or the UK. You know, I think he's a phenomenal DJ. I like, I, I enjoy what I enjoy his style of DJing. But I never knew that he had a story to tell and opened up. And he's like, and and you got that out of him. You know, you actually helped him almost. 
pretty much you know i pretty much do do, i just said you have to you have to just you have to be relaxed i just said to him just just let me do my thing yeah and we'll get there tell your story from chicago all the way we're gonna and we became very close because of him and because of this right I ask the questions others are afraid to ask. I'm not afraid. The reason why I'm not afraid is is because I don't have anything to lose. I'm just bringing something out that has been spoken about, needs to come out. You need to correct that now. Right. I'm not vigilant. I'm not here to hurt anyone. No, of course. I'm just here to do what I do. Right. Just bring information, make you, you know, make everyone aware, you know, good of the good of someone. Not, it's not always, it's not always based on dark, negative stuff. This is stuff right. that people sometimes they don't get it right. If COVID didn't happen, I would never have probably done this. Yeah, Why I gonna, would I? I was gonna say, I was gonna, t- I was gonna ask you, like, if COVID wasn't around for this, would you have done this? Out of a dark period came something that I felt was needed, some light. Right. I was watching everyone else doing the mundane DJ sets. And I said, I am not doing that. There's too many guys. It's, it's, sa- it's saturated. Oh, God. At first, it was cool. Right. Week three, week four. Four week eight week twelve. I'm like, no. There's so many. It's like it was almost like a virus of DJs streaming online. You know, that's what it was. Like every second you turn, somebody else is playing. It's like <laughs> it was like, this is not good. But we, but we all did it though. We all tried it. We all did. Yeah, no, no. You know? I'm it. Look, look. Therapeutically, it had to be done. Off a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Therapeutically, I'm not going to say I'm not knocking anything. Right. But, oh my God, it was ridiculous. It was it was just a plethora of too many. Right. All around the world doing it. This is pre Twitch. Yeah. This is this is in the this is <laughs> when this is when the Iron Curtain of COVID came, and lockdown started, and I watched everybody go into a tailspin and say. What do I do now? What do I do now? And gotcha. they just started DJing. I said, "Oh my God, this is cool," but then it wasn't cool no more. It was too much. Well, they like, would shut you it, down. They would they would shut you down if if they recognized mainstream music. You know, any music, anything that was digitally available. Right. The, ro- the robots True. were already on top of it, so right. that's that's what I said. What can I do? What can I do that brings joy and information to everybody? Where true house? Yeah, yeah, dude. That's exactly. I was like sitting there going, "That's all it was." Yeah, I said I have all this. Oh, I won't lie. I have friends for years telling me, "Lenny, when are you going to write this book? When are you going to write this book? When are you going to write this book? When are you going to write this book?" And I said. This is where I always learn I put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> because I always say I'm not going to do this. Yeah. I wind up, I wind up doing that. And then I do more. <laughs> because I always say I'm not I'm not doing that. I'm yeah. Not. And here we go. But did you start a book? Did you start writing a book? Well, not yet. I'm, I, I wrote scripts, though. That's where it starts, man. That's where it starts. We have a script. We have two scripts. One already pitching and one is... For this show, for True House, which which hopefully soon will be leaving where it's at and going to a massive platform. I'm in negotiations now. I don't want to jinx it. Just want to leave it like that. Good but, luck to you, man. But awesome. here's 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 the thing. My friends were telling me, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And I said, I ain't writing no book. Well, every week we're writing a book. <laughs> It's no joke. Every week, every time I sit with an artist, yeah, each one You're ready? becomes yeah. like a documentary. It's a chapter in a book. It's, it's a chapter. Look at the get. Yeah, look at the, important. Every one of them is important. Like the 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 guests you've had in your show, 
Carl Cox, DJ Spent, DJ Mem, like unbelievable on how you, you know, I don't know how you pitch it to them. I don't know. I don't know if you just so let me call you, them. Dave. Hey, Dave, it's Lenny, baby. <laughs> What's up, Lenny? You want to come on True House Stories? That's all it is. That's yeah. crazy, man. Well, what do you, 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 you got questions for me? I got no. They, they love what I say. I don't know questions for you. <laughs> so you I'll, I'll give you an example. I spoke to EDX today, Morito Kalela. EDX. Yeah. EDX. I know EDX forever. Saw him in AD. He comes running up to me. I'm having a meeting. He says, hey, bro. <laughs> I, I haven't seen you so long. How are you? We hug each other. He says, I want to come on the show. Okay. So I send him a message. And he calls me on my phone. He says, so I'm coming on? Okay. I could do December. He says, you have questions? I says, I don't got no questions for you. I have <laughs> He says, you don't have to send me a bullet point. I said, I'm going to send you nothing. He says, if I watch the one with Louis Vega, and then, I says, well, then you see what I do, right? One question. Right. Everybody one question. loves that. Well, what are we going to talk about? Do I have enough time? This is the next question I get. Do I have enough time? No. Uh, I don't think I have enough to say within the time limit, right? They tell me. Right. I'm like, well, how long do you think it's going to be? Well, it could be one hour or maybe two. Depends. If your car cock could be four. If it's Danny, it was three. Right. Danny said to me straight up, Oh, I'm really nervous. I said, Wow. Danny, really? This is, yeah. He says, I don't like to. Danny, listen. It's like you and I talking. And as we're doing this and we're in the truck, Danny says to me every time, It's like I'm only talking to you. I says, but you are only talking to me. The only right. issue is, it's a lot of people listening. I, so, that's right. watching and listening, but yeah, yeah. But the point, my point is, is this: it's really simple. It's comfortability of the host, like you and I are talking right now. Right. You're very relaxed. I'm relaxed. There's no pretensional thing here. Yes, right. I look at your bullet points. I looked at them like I just quickly because i know how these things go you you actually have a format you try to stick on format unless it's a a show where i'm sitting with questions right it's more yours is more of the noisy chat podcast is a relaxed we just go on and we talk and then you know people will pick up what we're saying i don't i don't ever want to make someone feel like congruence is part of this problem. You know, like, I have to be within that box in that time. If it takes you a little longer, go ahead, tell us, tell us, explain. And I don't cut off my, my uh, I was going to say my axe. I don't cut off my, <laughs> my, my uh, right. people that I'm sitting to. Right. I don't, I want them to get their point out because a lot of times it does take people a moment for them to feel relaxed, to, to let that stuff come out. It's, it's more of a therapeutic thing, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying, than it being... Of course it is. Than it being... Because a, a structured thing, you know? Because if I have it structured... But it's funny, EDX is like, okay, I'm going to watch two or three of the shows. I said, go ahead. Hey, don't worry. <laughs> Send me pictures, too. Because I like to show and tell. I love doing show and tell, too. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> Little old picture from the old days. Nikki Siano was great. Yeah. The studio for the, for the gallery. For, people were like, wow. We want to teach. I want to teach. I want to mentor. Yes. I want to learn all this. I don't want it to stay with me. I want this information out there for all of you to take right. to you around. Because what is it going to do with me? And let's say, for instance, Frankie Knuckles, right? You know, obviously, an icon uh, of a DJ, remixer, producer. You know, uh, like have, have what's your relationship with with him back in the day, <laughs> Francis? Rest in peace. God loved him. He loved 
well, let's say it was mutual. Mm -hmm. My admiration for him was, I pined at him when I saw him. Even though he was our friend, even though he was an ally, he 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 championed my records. Uh, I give you. I always talk about this story. South Factory Bar, going to see him on a Friday night, and hanging out with him, at his booth, and the way he, the way he to played records, the way he finessed the from the from the rack to the turntable. My record. Let's just talk about him playing my record. Okay. Okay. I made this record, right? Produced it, mixed it, and I'm sitting on the side watching him play into my record. The, him mixing into it, the crowd screaming on it. Goosebumps, it's, man. It's like, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like my record. <laughs> it's Frankie Fied. It's, I can't explain it. I was just, a gobsmack. I'd be like, yeah. like that going. <laughs> why does it seem so different? Why? The way he Tell mixed me. it in, the way it's EQ'd. It just was, it was just, it was like, like an out of body experience for me. Right. That's how I felt. I could tell you exactly the record. A Place Called Heaven and the group was called Tension. It was on Azuli. Okay. He was playing that record and I heard a lot of guys. I played the record myself. Mixed it, the whole thing. I heard him play it. I was just God, blown away. Wow. The way he set it up into the next record. Beautifully done. The mix was fabulous. The blend was right. The time of night was right. I was like, <laughs> damn, Frankie. The moon was right. I mean, everything was right. He had the right crowd for it. Man. In New York City. At Sound Factory. It was amazing. It was all of it. It was all, everything was right about it. You know, it was like. Unbelievable. It's like, baby, what do you think? I said, I was like, oh, my God. And. <laughs> But Frankie's like this. If he didn't like you, you knew it. Because he just didn't have time for you. He was a sweetheart with everybody. If he liked you, you also knew. And he also told you off when you were wrong. That's how much he cared for you. Like, I had to... See, I'll go to a conversation I had with him. He's no longer here. I'll talk about it now. Yeah. Um, this is when I was doing the Larry Levan story for the BBC, the Legends of the Dance Floor. So I call Frankie and I'm interviewing Frankie for the actual recording. So before we get into it, I'm like, Frankie, you know, I'm saying to him, this is around 2011. They just don't want to our music anymore and he's like he's like do you think it's only you like i was telling him like nobody wants me no more and i'm kind of like crying not crying you know just talking right right and he's like girl pull it together <laughs> and that he said, what do you think this is you he said you gotta keep pushing you gotta show them you can do it don't let them stop you I took that to heart when he told me that. Mm. He was right. And I put that phone down after that interview with him doing the whole thing for me, for Larry, because he was very close friends with Larry. I took those words to heart. Never let those words go anywhere further than, you know, it, it, gave, me, it gave me the strength I needed during that time because EDM was, you know, you got to remember everyone, this is around the time EDM was at its peaking part. Okay. So, soulful house, disco house, all that type of, you know, gospel house, they weren't having it. 
And it was difficult to get that kind of good work that we were used to. Mm. You know, we were over, we were overlooked for a while during that era. You know, so he's like, I'm struggling, I'm pushing. And he said that, and I'm on the men, baby. I said, I hear you. And 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 it takes a lot for someone to tell you that. So you know, you take those words for what they're worth, but I'll tell you, when you're inside, everyone thinks on the outside everything is always amazing, but it's not always amazing. You know, inside we could be crumbling. You wouldn't know right. it, but that's just the way it is because we're not going to make public announcements. Hey, things are not going the way we like. Or we're not getting the gigs we want or the records are not getting picked up because – you know, the record labels weren't feeling that stuff. It's just, you know, that's just the way. It was like an in-between time, you know. But those who stood on prevailed and kept going. I And I, I refused. I refused to let that surmise me. You know, right. I refused. Yeah. I just, I saw nothing less. I loved this music too much. I loved it with everything I got, you know. Unbelievable. With an, <clears throat> and you were obviously very close to him. Oh, and, yeah. You know, like I, I I, get goosebumps just thinking about it because it's like, you know, you know, you you have been around. You're a legend. You know, you, all these iconic DJs that that uh, back in the day. And, you know, Frankie Knuckles is like up here. At least it's he's a it's a big name. You know, it's like he would take a track like he'd took yours and you're like is this my track that that he's playing because it's it's it just he knew how to create the mood with every track he played mixing it cueing it up however he did it you know it is it, it's just amazing i mean like obviously tears is one of the one of my favorite tracks from him i mean it's been rendered so many times by different people but you know his track was just you know Incredible. A record that stands out for me with him and Eric Cup was that Fable record. Okay. The Lil Lewis when they remixed that. That right. I still play that and it makes me go nuts. I mean, whistle song. I mean, it's so <laughs> many. Great <laughs> so many, of course. It's so many great record, Frankie Knuckle records. But Frankie has a special place in my heart because, you know, without him, without Tony Humphreys, without yeah. particular people championing the music, we wouldn't have the careers we have today. It's the way it is. Yeah, man. You know, they, they, the, they set the you know, they set the standards for everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Who's taking care of uh, of of Francis' stuff right now? Is there like a, a company or corporation that that's that's doing that right now? From what I know, I know the collection went to um a museum in Chicago. And I think there's the Frankie Knuckles Foundation that handles the estate part of it. Gotcha. Family wise, does he have does he have family that's that's around? I knew he had some family, but I I I, I never met any of them. I only knew Frankie. Um, I never met the family people that Frankie yeah. was what you call the quintessential gay DJ. You know, he he lived that life. Gotcha. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know. He's he was he was he's originally from New York, mm -hmm. uh, and for those that never knew about Frankie, his life, Frankie started in New York. Was friends with Larry. Went to the same high school. Larry Levan. Him and Larry went to the same high school together, and they started playing at the Continental Bats in New York. It's around 1972. Um, and if I remember correctly, Nikki Siano and Frankie, Frankie went to work for Nikki at gallery Okay. and Nikki had him doing all the stuff around the club, uh, uh, decorating, taking care of the kitchen, you know, all the stuff you do when you run a club for sure. Um, and along that came learning how to play music and Nikki kind of showed Frankie and Larry. So when Continental Bats 
opened up a spot. Larry heard about it. Larry was doing lights at Nikki Sienna's gallery. Larry went to go run and work at Continental, and then Frankie came and followed him, and Frankie started picking up after Larry. Larry went to another club. Frankie stood at Continental. And the slots in New York became difficult. So when Chicago owner, I can't remember his name, um, right off the top of my head now, Robert, I can't remember his name, Robert, um, he opened up his club, was going to open up his club, he wanted to bring Larry LeVan. And Larry said, listen, I'm involved with, you know, starting his club garage because he was at Reed Street at the time. He says, but my friend Frankie, I know. And Robert went to meet up with Frankie. Well, Frankie over in Chicago had had him play. Mm -hmm. And that's how that whole story begins. (coughs) Frankie becomes the DJ in Chicago, creates a story. Larry creates garage and they're both at the same time going 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 and frankie along the way starts to get his mark in the house music where larry's demise as frankie's going up larry's demise is beginning mm. you know i'm saying so yeah, frankie comes back to new york to play at that point larry's already done Due to bad decisions, drugs, and lifestyle, and Frankie's, um, well, let's put it like this, Frankie Knuckles' fame in New York really takes off at that time. Late 80s when he comes back and into the 90s, and then the whole house music thing, as you all know the rest of the story, but that's a kind of a, an, an overview of how that all went down. So some of the Chicago people said, well, if Larry would have came here, then Frankie would have been at the garage. I don't know if Frankie would have been at the garage. But right. the way it went was Larry stood in New York, Frankie stood in Chicago. So they got their own Larry LeVan, which is Frankie Knuckles. And New York was Larry LeVan. So you had two black right. gay DJs that set a standard in the dance music industry that was unprecedented, both of them. And both best friends. You know, they both did amazing, amazing things in their lives. Amazing. That's crazy. But Frankie was also, he was also in a music production, correct? So was Larry. So was Larry. Larry had Peach Boys. Larry had Garage Records. Larry was doing remixes. Frankie was doing remixes. So both of them were doing it. You know, think about it. They're both doing, you know, and both were into fashion. That's, That's why right. they wanted to be a fashion designer. So did Frankie. Huh. They went with to FIT. It's crazy. Yeah. They both end up playing records and becoming world-renowned, massive DJs. Larry did things before anybody else did things. Man. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. Larry toured before anybody else toured. And he had the best sound system and the best nightclub in the world. Nobody had that club. Nobody had garage like that. Right. There was clubs around. Yeah. But there was no Paradise Garage like Paradise Garage. That's where, and Paradise Garage was was right in New York. Where was that? It was, in, it was on King Street, off of Barrack, right in Manhattan, downtown. Where? What? What is it now? Well, it's no longer there. They then just knocked the building down not too long, a couple of years back, uh, two years before COVID, two or three years. And they built mm. a high, um, an apartment complex in its spot. Yeah. yeah. That's but what usually up, happens. But up until it was 2017, the actual building was owned by the telephone company of New York. Oh, wow. Bob Bell owned it. And what they originally did was they leased it as a parking garage. Michael Brody leased it. And he found that club because... It was actually a club before he got. It was called the Chameleon. And then when he got in there, he was parking cars and then building his club. But he brought Larry LeVan in, so they started slow. They were were doing construction parties. 1976, 1977. They finally got open in January of 77, and they closed in 87. So they were really open for 10 years. Right. But he was like the king of his castle. 
there was the, his, there was a lot of his element. In New York. He, there was a lot yeah. of clubs in New York. Yeah. But not not at the level of garage. Garage mm. was his home, like him, like you playing in his living room, but his right. living room was three thousand people. <laughs> Jesus. Two and a half, three thousand people. Easily. Wow. On a weekend, they have five, six thousand. They might be too far to say that, but five, six thousand people in that room. So if you had a hit record, if Larry was playing a record of yours through a weekend, it was massive. By the next week, the record was known all over New York already. People See, were talking, looking for the record. Yo, what's this record <laughs> Larry playing? Like that's, that all the time. that's just like that's like today's version of social media. If Correct. a DJ, if the DJ is going to play a, a, you know, a track from somebody, and they play it and it's a hit, people are going to buy it off beat source tracks, you know, wherever they're going to they're going to buy it. Yeah, but you know what? It's this is a little bit different now. This is because we have a fragmented situation. It is too many. Let's put it like this: because there wasn't that many records around that time, mm -hmm. a record would stand out like that. Within two, three weeks, this record was like huge. Radio plays and everything. Right. Now, a record does that for it to get to Spotify level and all that, the algorithms, it's not easy in a dance record. It's too fragmented, you know? Um, yeah. But we hope yeah, it can yeah. come back like that. You're into music production as well, correct? You got your record label. I've been mixing records since 1988. The uh, making records, yeah. Now the studio uh, that 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 we see behind you, that's that. How many years is it in the making of that? Like how long did that take it to be? This is studio. This studio has been here. This studio was built in 1999. Wow. This okay. Studio. So this this studio that you guys see that I have behind me has been here since 99. That's that's it's got some years behind you, man, for sure. Twenty four, wow, three years. So this studio, <laughs> mind you, my other studio before this was from yes, yeah, since I had it since nineteen eighty eight. So, yeah. but I wasn't here. It was in another place I was at. Right. So I think I've been doing this for a minute. But you know what? In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't feel that long. Because you're happy, I think, because you're having fun at it, man. It's everything's a challenge. It's a great challenge for you to to do this on a daily basis. You know? Yeah, and no. Um, I would feel like that. You know, if I don't feel like it's a job, it's because the passion is there. You're doing different things. You're loving it, but. I mean, I guess everyone has a different feeling about it, for sure. I love it. Don't get me wrong. But you know what the problem is? It's a job. And you have to treat it that way if you want to be successful at it. Mm -hmm. You have to have principles. And you have to have, you know, it's like not having a diary, but you got to have, you got to have, if you want to make it at this, I always said, you have to be dedicated. On it, you can't play this as a hobby, like you know. Oh, I'll do it today, no, and then go it, play for two months <laughs> and come back. I got news yeah. for you, yeah, that doesn't happen. It's no, of course, man. It's no, good. it's not gonna work, man. It's not gonna work. You got to treat it like, like I said, we talked about structure. You have to have, you have, if you're gonna be that entrepreneur, if you're gonna be that business owner, you need to treat it like a business, it's not a hobby or a side job or a side business. This is what this is what generates income you know correct you need to you need to make money well in order to make it and also compete you must be up on all the technology if you want to be good at this plus let's not forget you have also the task of keeping social media running too alongside with being a producer a writer a dj if you have a family and that into the mix and all the yeah. other shit that goes along with it. It's like it's not just it's not just oh well we'll turn on the board now. Yeah. You can do that. You can do that. It's I'm sure. not saying I'm, I'm not here to 
I'm not here to bitch slap anybody. No, 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 no. But here's the thing. I talked about this with other people that do this as well for a living. And they say it the same way. If you're not in it 24-7, you're not going to ever be able to be truly successful at it. You know who said that to me was I had I had a chat with Alexa Tipple in the UK. And I think you know her as well. She's She said the same thing. She says, if you're not into it 24-7, seven days a week, putting the hours in, then it's it's not not going to work. No, it's difficult because the moment you get something running and then you don't and you stop for a while, you have to restart again. And yeah, of course. Hard, that's a hard thing every time to stop and start again. You get to the point when you do the stops and the longer you do the stop parts, it gets harder to come back and do the go. It's hard to catch back up, to catch yeah. up again. You don't catch up. You don't yeah, catch you don't. up. You're right. You wind you up don't. losing that time and you say to yourself, <laughs> what the hell am I doing? <laughs> you know, you have to think about it. Man, are you using are you using also the new style digital production studio equipment and analog stuff as well? The joys of what we do is if you want to stay in this, you have to you have to kind of move with the times. Right. So I am working. So the question is to the I should say the answer is yes. yes, I am working inside the box, which is the computer, and I can work outside the box. Gotcha. But speed reasons, it's a lot easier working inside the box because with analog gear, it's temperamental. You also have to when you're doing different records, if you flip it from record to record, it's not that easy to recall on a on a console. Mm. You have to meaning you have to each pot has to be moved. You know oh, what I'm geez. saying? So the EQ right. points and all that. With yeah. inside the computer, you can you can do five, six records simultaneously. <laughs> it's, it's true. You can do a hundred records, a thousand records if you I want. Know. It all depends yeah. on you because the all the settings come up for that particular record and all that. With with the with the uh, with the actual physical mixing console, everything has to be programmed physically. Right. That's why years ago when you made records, you had to kind of get yourself through a record, finish it, and move on to the next record. Because if you try to do something what they call the recall, recall is where you had to bring the record back up and try to get to sound like what you have on the on the master or what the record sounds like, it never really sounds exactly the same again when you bring it back. You know, mm. settings sound a little bit different or sometimes the record may sound just a bit, never like magically what happened when you mixed it that time. But now with digital, if you mix this 10 years ago in digital, when you bring it back up, it's going to come in exactly the way you had it. Yeah, and obviously you're mastering everything in house as well. If you're well, no, right? no, no, I send that stuff out to you, master because I'm old school like that. I like somebody else to touch ah. it to give it that that gloss. You know, that it's like the clear coat of the, of the car when okay. you put that gloss the end. You know, I like to have somebody touch the record to all right. Give me a bit. Kurt, of a, that's good. A that's sheet. good. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I come to I, I look back in the day. <laughs> I come off the I come off the guys from the seventies and eighties. You know what I was what I was when I was coming up, and a lot of the techniques that were shown to me were stuff they were doing during that era. Hmm. That never left me. What I did was with today's way, as I implemented some of that old style of work, and converted it into the digital world. Gotcha. I make my records sound the way they do. Right. But there's some things I still like to do. I still like to work with a lot of musicians at times. Okay. Where I'll bring in a, you know, a bass guitar player, a guitar player, a horn player in, you know, when I need to track it. Also, nice. I like to have where I send what they call the pre-master. Meaning this is the mix before it's that finished sound that you get used that you're used to hearing. Mm -hmm. And send it to a mastering engineer to have them give it 
that loudness effect and that spaciousness, that glossiness in the end. You know what I'm saying? that That's important to me. I did it with the Hell Yeah. I've done it with all my big records. I send them out to really good mastering guys. Because I believe awesome. that's a very it's an art. And I like to have another I like to have another set of ears on it. I was just gonna say another set of ears is always want someone else to have a listen to it. Perspectiveness is very important mm -hmm. in artwork. Somebody right. else can see your piece of art and see a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. Including musically. You're listening to something, I, you know, you could give me as a producer something, I'll hear something completely different than you're hearing. It's all in the perspective. Has that happened? I've also been told where maybe the mix wasn't co correct in certain parts and had, and I've had them come back and say to me, do me a favor, can you go back in and adjust this and then send it back to me? And then after hearing it, they were right. You know, see, yeah, it works, it, man. It, it makes a difference because sometimes, you know, you hear certain people's music and you say, "Christ, it sounds very linear," and a lot of times that is because they're in the inception, they're in the mm -hmm. middle part, they're in the ending, they're in the distribution. They're not feeding off anyone else to get someone's opinion to to say, "Hey, this is not correct." Right. Or what if you tried a way of saying it? What if you tried this? You know, yeah. and it makes yeah. a real difference. Of course. Speaking of your your track, Hell Yeah, which is an awesome track. <clears throat> tell us a story. Oh, my, my pleasure, man. Tell us a story behind the making of Hell Yeah. Well, the artist Vangela Crow. Mm -hmm. Um, another producer sent me a song of hers and I loved her voice. Reminded me of an 80s R&B like a uh, Evelyn Champagne King or that kind of sound. I said, mm -hmm. man, if I can figure something out. So I heard her voice. Got a really cool record. For my DJ sets, this was about a year and a half before I started working with her. And I contacted it. His, his name is Larry. I said, Larry, listen, you know, managed her. I said, would she be into doing a record with me? He said, dude, I know she would. I'll set it up. <laughs> so I said, all right. So we spoke. And the way it works with me is I need to have a muse. So, for example, when I mean I have a muse, now that I know she's around me, mm -hmm. now I'm going to start to think about what I could put together that I feel is going to work for her. So I came up with the track, the music that you heard, mm -hmm. and I sent it over to her. And she calls me up. She says, I love it. I have an idea. She goes in. She says, I got this idea. I want the whole crowd to sing to the song. Okay, cool. So she doesn't have any way of really recording it at her spot. She says, look, she sang it to me on the phone. She's singing it in parts. I'm getting a gist of what this is. I'm like, okay, that's pretty, pretty cool. Let's schedule to come in. So she comes here, the studio. Yeah. She starts to, she says, all right. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to sing each part down. It's perfect. I said, I won't say anything to you. We'll just record it because I, I have to see the end. I have to hear the end. Let's see. I have to hear the end result before I make a decision. So she starts putting down the parts. Let's first verse, second verse, the backing vocal. Listen to it. I said, all right, leave with me. She goes home. I send her MP3. And then I say to her, I need you to come back. I need you to do this, this, and this. Changes on the parts. Right. Totally agree. Because now you can hear the actual schematic is starting to become a song. 
And then it so happens at the time, Manny Ward, who's DJed up there, and we used to play at Stereo with Angel Marais. Mm -hmm. Manny calls me up and says, Lenny, listen, I'm doing this project. Can we use your studio? I said, sure. So he came and used my studio. And while he was here, I said, before you leave, can you do me a favor? Can you sing the backing parts to Hell Yeah? But I just need Hell Yeah! Like the crowd. <laughs> the man and all that were here. I recorded after their session. They finished their session. I, I said, real quick. They all put down their parts. And that's how I build that part where it goes, Hell Yeah! And then she heard that. She came back in and then sang the ad-libs over that. <laughs> now, Here's the funny part. Mm -hmm. I did the track in 2018. Okay. We were getting ready to put this out March of 2020. <laughs> Do you remember, everybody remembers what March 2020 was? Lockdown started. It was, yeah, everything was shut down. So as we have everything set up in distribution to go, my partner Manuel calls me and says, what do you want to do? Do you want to still go forward with Lisa? I says, no, pull it. I says, Manuel, if we go and put this record out, it will be lost. It's mm. too good of a record to put out right. with no club scene, nobody to Wolf's going to be playing this record, I said. Who's, there's no clubs. You made a smart decision. That was a smart move. I just said, hey, you know what? You sure? I said, I'm not. I know I'm more than sure. Put the record away. Yeah. We'll wait to see what happens another day. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> COVID comes. So now, while we're in COVID, this gives me time to pull out a machine called a DAP machine a digital audio tape machine, and Manuel says to me, while we have downtime, can you pull out your old masters and can we start getting those old dad tapes converted to digital files? Like from when? Like back in the 80s? The 90s and stuff. Wow. We started releasing all this old catalog stuff during that time. Stuff that was lost that I forgot about. <laughs> it gave me time. I had right here, I had all my boxes, and I was just converting all the stuff to digital files, remastering everything. And that's all we did during COVID. That was a big part of my life at that time. It was like, go and look back. So it gave me time to look back at my work, my life's work at that time. And those type of records, which I had mm -hmm. ready to come out as brand new, like a hell yeah. Right. And the rest was history. So that's the story behind it. Oh, yeah. Love it. So, Love it. Hell yeah comes now. I start to promote it. Mm -hmm. I sent it to David Morales. I sent him a WhatsApp. <laughs> Yo, bro. You got the hell yeah? Hell he says, yeah. Do me a favor. Send it again to me right now. <laughs> he sends it again. And then he's doing Sunday Mass. He starts playing the record. Announces to everybody, yo, Lenny's doing his thing with this shit. He's all that. <laughs> you know, like, now David talk. That's just hot. <laughs> you know, saying all that good stuff like that. I'm cracking up. My brother, Lenny's doing his thing with this hell yeah. And I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting video messages from people, from my friends. And I'm like, so he goes, yo, I want to remix it. What do you tell the king of house? No. What are you going to say? I said, shit, yeah, I'll send you the parts. So he was like, down. He, he, he was all over that. Three days he had that record ready. That's wow. he had a remix. when he Because I know how he is. When he's feeling it, he's all over it. He's all, all over, over it. it. He called me up. What do you think? I loved it. I heard the mix. I said, dude, it's so classic Morales. Yeah. Classic deaf mix sound. Yeah. That's I said, David, you hit the mark. He said, You really like it? I said, I love it. 
So I wouldn't lie to you. So I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm glad it, we went with it. It did really well with his remix. It did well with my version. Mm. I'm proud to be able to say he's um, involved in it. I was thrilled. He's he's a wonderful person. He's a great remixer. Talented motherfucker. I mean, there yeah. ain't nothing better than having a Morales remix. It brought so much to New York guys doing what we do. You know, for me, it was like he took something and embellished it, and 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 I put the I put the money and 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 when I say and and I put the money and the power behind it with the best right. record promoters I hired in the UK. It was the best thing for I for, to do for that project. <laughs> Because it brought so much notoriety to me. It, it brought me right in the in the front line right now. So, it, so it basically what it showed was, hey, I could still do this post-COVID. Right. Not that it should have ever ended. But, you know, people's thinking, strange. Somehow they think time goes by and something happens. Like you lose yeah. something. Mm -hmm. So if you had doubts about me making records, let's end that doubt here and now. This record sets precedence that I could still do what I do and still make it the right way. I'm not going to say I'm the best. I'm not going to say I'm the worst. I do something that I feel is the best I can deliver. Yeah, of course. Of course. Now, your, your um, tracks that you've digitalized back during the COVID shutdown, are these some of the tracks that, that you are going to be starting to look back and say, okay, I'm going to pull this one off. Let's see how this is. And, and you're going to, you're going to start creating tracks based on. Well, it's funny. You mentioned that. It's funny. You mentioned that. So let's go into today's Amsterdam dance event. Sure. So I'm on the street. And who do I, who do I run into? I run into Good. one of the biggest A&R men in the game. Who is now, you know, has always been a DJ and he's got the biggest brand in the world, Defected Records. Defected Records. So all you guys know Defected, you know that little label called Defected in the UK? And he says to me, and we hugged each other because, you know, I've had hit records with him. Mm -hmm. um, those that know my history. Anyway, he says to me in the street, dude, you know people after your old stuff. I'm saying, well, what old? He's like, there's a record my a and my junior a and guy has been pestering me about. Loves this record. I'm like, which one is it? Said, New York something. So we left it off like that. It's a record mm -hmm. I did in the 90s. Wow. Because I want to grab it for defecting. <laughs> now, mind you, I put it back out on Karmic. Mm -hmm. But they've been... Looking at all my stuff. It's called Holler, New York Thunder. It's on my record label. Defected says to me, I want to I want the record. I want to grab it. So we're talking about it now. So you talk about my old stuff. That record was done in the mid-90s. He said, dude, they don't want you new shit. He said, just like that. They want you old shit. <laughs> I laughed and I went, wait, we talk like that. You need not want my old shit. You want my old shit that I made back in 30 years ago? He's like, yeah. <laughs> You know what they want? He says these kids are going, and I know that they're looking for the old stuff because I get those constant emails, messages. You know, you this record you did back in 1994. Yep. You know, is that on digital? A lot of stuff was not around. Mm -hmm. the vinyls were around, but they weren't digitized. So what I did was I went ahead and digitized all that stuff that was only available on vinyl. <laughs> Smart and that, move. And I did it during again, once again. I needed to do things during COVID. <laughs> that was nothing that I've been putting off forever. Right. And my partner said, "Perfect, perfect. Now you have all the time in the world." <laughs> and I said, "You're right. No excuse why you can." And he said, "No, you're dead right." Yeah. And I did it. There was so many records that wow. were only on digital i'm sorry and are you wrong a, a vinyl only on vinyl that were never right. they just they just weren't they were pre the digital era right it's pre-digital crazy right people that's so saying, cool man damn you well right now you can go on karmic hyphen power hyphen records.com karmic mm -hmm. hyphen power records hyphen 
power hyphen records dot com, and you'll see all those records are there. We also oh, you can yeah I can buy them on there. Yes, you can. You could go on Beatport. You could go on Track Source. Yeah, they're all around. And all the platforms. If, and you, if you're not, you go on Spotify. <laughs> That's awesome, man. And you're getting, and I'm I'm sure you get a ton of people saying, why didn't you bring this out sooner? Right? Dude. I want to do a lot of things. I know. I mean, I just, you should have, could have, would have. You know? Why did I do this? <laughs> why did I write a book? Why did I right. make a movie? I never thought I'd write scripts. I never thought I'd be doing talk shows. And then not only that, the talk show I also do the radio show, True House Stories Takeover. Yeah. Radio show. So it's 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 just it's you know, you know, you know, I tell everyone, here's the thing. You know that word never? Be careful with that word because I constantly right. say it and I always say it to myself, but I say that. Now I'm doing it. And Good I'm like or you know, whatever it is. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Are you still? Are you getting? Are you getting like um, a, a, I guess just fans or actually not fans. I mean, yeah, fans of you, potential producers that that's that send demos to you to have a listen. All the time. All the time, man. Car and Power Records would constantly. If you have a if you have a single you think that we should hear, upload it right onto the site. Go right to the website, demo submission. Yeah. Always, I'm checking everything because you never know. Hmm. My motto is, um, I, 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 I'll share this other funny story with you. I had a chance to sign Eddie Amador's big record called House House Music, hmm. and I turned it, and I turned it away. And Deep wow. Dish signed it to Yoshitoshi. Well, that was the rest of his history. House music. How record was massive, massive club record, massive right. hit. I swore after I did that, I would never <laughs> let anything go by again. That's why I kept everything. <laughs> I turned that record away. Big stupid maneuver. We're friends, me and Eddie. Really good yeah. friends. But I had the chance way before anybody else to get that record. Man. And I said, nah, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna do nothing. Yeah, well, <laughs> speaking now, later. When you do get, when you find that right track that someone sends to you, like, is it, is it, um, is that like part of your business of what you do, or do you sort of just branch it off to other? other record labels that might have different genres that they're sending over to you that doesn't fit in with you? No, I don't even do that anymore. Um, okay. If it just doesn't fit, it just doesn't. I mean, I, 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 I'll only go after, listen, for the amount of time it takes to do everything these days, I'll send to Manuel a list of records I feel we could sign, and then gotcha. he'll go ahead and proceed to send out a message saying, you know, we're, we're interested in the record. Yada yada yada, yeah. um, and four to five times we're signing stuff, or it could be a, a problem. Maybe you don't have the clearance on the vocals. A lot of times, right. you're dealing with new producers; they don't understand the ins and outs of the record business stuff, the legal side. Right. Sometimes I gotta walk away from records because sometimes they use the samples where you go. Oh no! If you put that out, we'll, get, we'll definitely have a problem. You know, I'm You're not. I, I, yeah, <laughs> you just, I know because I know the records where they got them from. Right. You know, so you got you got to look into all these parameters. You know, and yeah. I love sampled records. Don't get me wrong, but sometimes yeah. there's certain samples where I have to go. I can't touch that. Yeah, I know it's going to be a. You know, you know it's going to be an issue. Is it worth putting this? In? Well, what's where's the win on this? It's not going to be a win, you know. It's going to be right. more of we're paying. We're paying, paying a ton everything. of money. Yeah, going to be. Hey, look, look. 
there is situations where those type of things are necessary mm -hmm. for the betterment of a hit. Right. And I mean a hit being like commercial hit. You will overlook those hardships because you know there's so many fruitful parts you're going to win. You know, that's where you have to make the deal with the devil. <laughs> You're right. It's You're absolutely right. Level for the betterment of the overall game. Right. You know, you may not make it on the front end from the record, but then there'll be a lot of the fringe benefits that will come in from the back end. Of course. Absolutely. And that's hmm. part of understanding business. Mm -hmm. If you understand the record business and you understand the parameters of it and you have the, the insight and the fortitude to see past this piece, then you can be a success, but you got to know, understand what you're dealing with. Right. And a lot of these new kids have not a clue, nor can learn. They just want to sign. They don't give a yeah. shit. They'll sign whatever they, they're just signing away. I get, I send the con. Well, I don't send it. My partner sends the contract. I've gotten the contract back within 10 minutes later. I'm like, <laughs> I didn't even read it. <laughs> it's fucking signed it. I, I wait a minute. And in the contract, it says, please, you know, you make sure a solicitor or lawyer looks at it. I'm like, what? <laughs> that's how that's how these people are now. Wow. They don't see it from that respect. They yeah. see it more like, you know, it's my chance to get a record out. You know, they want to just want to get records right. out. They don't care who they're with. That's what they. That's what they want. They just want. Oh, I just want to get a record out. I just want to get a record out. They're all horny about getting a record out. You know. They want to be a star. Yeah, I know. They want to be a star without working for anything. They want everything to be like add the water to the powder, stir, and look, we have a drink. Right. Right. Exactly. But that 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 is just not just in music, Wendy. That's like in life. You know, well, I teach my, I teach my boys the same way when they're growing. I got three kids. I mean, I teach them the same way. And you can't have this like that. You need to you build can't that up. You can millions and billions of dollars. <laughs> of course, I know. Why, but why everybody and their mother <laughs> do everything? They need to post this, do that, cheat right? This, that. But if you're a one man shop coming up the hard way, yeah, yeah, you're not gonna you gotta work hard. You got to work hard for it. You do. Even as easy as everything looks, the social media, you still got to grind. You got to right. grind and grind and grind to get that level of success. Yeah, man. Of course. Of course. We we all do. You and I still do. You know, we're nothing's handed nothing's handed to us in a silver platter. Hey, dude, we're I'm still the working. Juggler, brother. I'm the juggler. I'm juggling <laughs> everything in their mother. It's like, and as I'm juggling, right? You're doing the juggle, right? You're doing this. Yeah, I have somebody else throwing me more shit, so I'm going. I'm like, Wait, <laughs> you're taking this and yeah, oh yeah, that's life. I don't care if you're Carl Cox, uh, Joe Biden, or your chancellor, or your prime minister. Yeah. Whatever level Jeez. you're at, you're juggling thousands. If you if you're a success, right? Or you're trying to be a success. So right. In order to make life work, you got to juggle everything. Everything needs some part of your time. Do you take care of your own social media? Well, yeah, kind of. And also, I have my partner, too. He's working on it as well, so we're together working. Gotcha. Um, you yeah. answer all the DMs, or do you have someone else to do it for you? You pretty much answer everything. I see comes the DMs coming. I'm doing them. Yeah. But as far as posting and stuff, he's helping me out as well with, right. this, with the record label stuff going on and yeah posting to my artist page and things like that yeah gotcha no i was just gonna say to do it right it takes a lot you gotta have some people are trying to you could do it yourself but i find he helps me out a lot with the back right. of course of course you need that i mean it's and like you said juggling you're juggling everything you know the music the production the social aspect the pr work i mean that's fuck, that's a ton of stuff to do you know it's 100%. It's a ton of juggling. Uh, Crazy. And, try, and here's the thing. So you're trying to do all this, you know, this mundane physical <laughs> postings and it's not physical work, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Then you got to be creative. 
Yeah. That's like, where did you find time for creativity in all this? Because you're you're writing, you're that that's all part of the creative. You gotta you gotta. It's a different mindset. Right. It's not just posting pictures. I gotta come up with a track that's gonna make. You know, you hope that people will like. You don't know. Right. Look, there's no guarantees. Yeah. There's yeah, no guarantees in no. nothing. Nope. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, some tracks I thought that I was really great, they didn't do nothing. And some that I didn't think were going to do nothing turned out to be huge. Yeah. You just don't know. You don't know. It's always like know. I always say, I always say it's luck of the draw. Truly is that luck of the draw. Hmm. When you plan for your shows and the true house stories, do you build like a full list and then you're out there calling them and then you schedule it into your into your assistant? No, correct? no. I, it may happen just from me looking at Facebook or something okay. where I may see somebody. Lately, I've been getting offers from PR companies coming to me now. Wow. Yeah, because they want to be on the show because they feel it's important for the artist. But pre to doing that, this is not everybody, but like, mm -hmm. for example, who did I see? Uh, I went for Kathy Sledge, for example, from, okay. from Sister Sledge. I started contacting her last year. We spoke a little bit, and then I contacted her in the summer, and she asked me to speak to her manager. We were trying for July. We're still trying to get dates. Meantime, I'm thinking, okay, while I did her, I was at Ministry of Sound for Spen's 10-year anniversary in London, and Booker T came up to me, and Eric Dial from Eric Dial was part of Vaughn Mason with the record Break for Love, okay? And Eric said to me, oh, man, Lenny, I'd love to be on the show. And I made a mental note because I'm really good at remembering stuff like this. Right. And after I said, Eric, do me a favor, send me a DM and we'll schedule. He's on December. No, he's on November. I'm sorry. Day before Thanksgiving, 23rd. 23rd, Definitely. 24th is, yeah. Yeah. So you see what I'm saying? So, so I'm looking at my hmm. calendar going, all right, I need to fill in the dates. And then I started to think about who I wanted to have on and who I haven't touched yet and right. who's relevant. Who's sometimes I like getting people that are not relevant in the sense of they're not in your face, mm -hmm. but we bring them on and all of a sudden they are now back in, in fashion again. Some people told me they've come on the show and work started to come in after that. Or may it be writing a record. Maybe that they're, they're back singing for somebody. Right. Maybe right. they got hired to do a booking. I've heard this a few times. Awesome. Because man. you don't know who the hell's watching your show. Right. Same with your show. Yeah. You don't absolutely. know who's going to be watching this show when it goes on. You just put it up. You don't know who's going to be watching who, what I'm saying. What's Lenny going to say next? They want to know. <laughs> You're absolutely right. 100% agree with you. You know, like, I mean, you mentioned Booker T. I mean, he was he was an awesome guy to talk to. Awesome guy to talk to. You know, he's got I, I, like I love his style of, of music, the soulfulness. And 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 and, uh, and I guess and also what I'm going to compare him to maybe to Ja Big, who was on your show and a Canadian boy. And, um, you know, and his style of mixing, like he he can put on a good storytelling with his music and, exactly. and whether it's Latin, whether it's Afro tribal, soulful, deep, whatever it may be, he, he can create a journey for you. And that's what I like to see in here. Me too. And I, I also know. like that he was loved by women. That was a <laughs> big attraction for me. Really? Okay. Said, that's good to know. I, I didn't said, know that. I said, yeah, I said, well, who's, the most followers on your YouTube. He says, women. 
And every woman I talk to says, I love Jabig. Why? He loved the music he plays. It's like he plays for the women. And I get it. I listen to the music, mix sets. And I was like, I could see where he's going with this. Yeah. It's very sensual, the sound. It's very, it's perfect, you know. Yeah. And yeah. and women appeal to that. Yeah. He's got it right on that, man. He's got it right on that. So you see, that's, so when I interviewed him, his interview was really cool too because here we go, a YouTube sensation. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't know much about him, but they know about his YouTubes. Right. Well, and now I they said, know more because of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we brought right? him out the forefront. Oh, yeah, now they really know about him now. Sure. You can go and listen to him talk, and he, he explained, I made him explain his life, you know, to really give an insight to who Jabig was. I mean, right. that was, is, and what is. he does. Yeah. And why he did this. He was one of the first guys to go on YouTube and do these things. Nobody was doing that back then. What's your uh, What's your favorite food? I enjoy Italian food. Yeah. I enjoy Italian food a lot. Yeah. Now, what part What part of Italy were you, was your family from? I'm going to say more of the, of the Campania area, the south, and you know, the food from that area of Napoli down to Sicily. Right. Okay. You know? You know, with the mozzarella and stuff. And oh, yeah. I enjoy all that. The pastas yeah, but, from down that area. But New York has got so many different Italian restaurants. Yes, and New different... York like a microcosm of Italy, for Christ's sake. But <laughs> I will say this. After yeah. you go to Italy and you've eaten, even in someone's garage, blows away any great Italian restaurant you've been anywhere. I nothing you. Is like eating in Italy. I so, believe you. There's nothing like it. When you have Japanese sushi, it's incredible. I'm not a big sushi guy for some reason. I don't know. Spanish food's the same. In Spain, in, when I've had in Spain, the top is amazing. Yeah, are you into uh, are you into hot sauces at all? Mm, I'm more mild. More mild. I'm going to send you some. I have another company that makes flavorful hot sauces that you cook with, and but I can do it. And... I just don't like when my tongue is burning. No, I don't. Nothing like nothing like that. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you some of our hot sauce. You know. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. No. Listen. I'm. It's pff, least I can do, man. I mean, it's amazing. I, I appreciate you coming down here and oh, coming well, coming online and talking about it. Um, you still get nervous when you when you're when you get up there the first time. Not nervous. Excited. Yeah. It's different. Like I'm like 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 a prize fighter. Like Love that. that. That's hit. awesome, man. Ding, 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 ding. Bang. <laughs> You're ready to go. That's it, man. Love it. Confident. You know, confident. That's what I, that's what I look for. Yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> you get, you, look, not every gig's going to go the way you want it to. There is no. nights, for <clears throat> even the best that you've had to, Make major changes to play different music to 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 satisfy your your listening audience. Right. Uh, if you're really caring about what you do and and how you're viewed, you want to make right. sure you're performing at your best. Sometimes you got to make a left or right turn. Yeah, absolutely, and that, and that's the. That is the confidence of that DJ, of, of that person to do that confidently and make it happen. Correct. Right. That's experience. That's where experience comes exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. They know how to change it up in case it's not working. You right. Know, instead of just playing a, you know, a set folder that, that they think that's going to work, but it's not going to. They're going to be a rude awakening. <laughs> there is people that do that. Yeah. And they don't veer off that set. Right. Where they're just like this. They're looking down at their their pioneers and never looking up at that crowd. And I always tell everyone, look what the people are doing. Don't worry about what that track's doing. Right. Because if that crowd ain't moving, you got a problem. Right. 
Look at the crowd. Look what they're look how they're moving. Like you look at the, read their body moving. language. Right. You better make a you better you better understand what you're dealing with and yeah. know how to make a quick change or something drastic because people are watching your moves. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Now that I guess we're traveling more, I guess you'd be you're gonna be doing some more traveling around what's your plans for the future like do you have a hit list of, of places you want to hit up yeah well i'm talking about going back out to asia and australia okay. now so that's that's oh, nice that's where i'm planning we're talking um, i'll be going back to abiza soon too next year It'll be my first awesome. time back in a long time so you know i don't know what's coming in front because there's a lot of things that are going to be changing and i can only say I'm going to be wherever they want me to be. Let's put right. it like that. Now, where they say they, is it you have an agent that does this for you? Or are you hustling all your gigs by your, for yourself? I've had my agent with me working. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, Karen's done a great job working with awesome. me. Um, and we'll see how we go. Because we don't know. What, you see, here's the thing. You don't know what the landscape is going to be. COVID could come back. You you know, you don't know. You don't know. There was a yeah. little bit of mention that UK could shut down again a little bit. We don't know. No. Uh, Sumiak was talking about it. You don't know. Maybe it could be hearsay. You don't know. But you, I, know. I say we don't. Let's know. hope it's that. Let's hope it's a hearsay. We don't you know? know. You got to hope. Jeez. I'm I'm going full steam ahead. You have to. You can't worry about that right now unless it, it is a reality. But you got to fucking go full steam ahead. You have to. Well, until the government says you can't come in, I'm full steam. Well, that's the thing. When well, the reality sets in, right? Because Canada just opened up, what, a couple months ago? The borders, yeah. Like we had, yes, you're right. Well, you the guys travel are partying, but I'm talking about traveling. Like, you know. Yes, we're partying, but you need, if you wanted to come into Canada, they weren't going to let you in. Right. Right. So you understand what I'm talking. See, you know, you're at the mercy of the governments again. So I know. What do you do? But if you if you drove, if you drove, you could have gone through. If you flew, you would have not gotten through. That's how crazy it is at the border. Okay. Now it's like changed. Now it's like flying, driving. You can walk across and not a, not an issue. Oh yeah, no, it's back to normal again. But yeah. to that, a few months ago, as far as I knew, you couldn't even get up there. No, you couldn't. You couldn't. I have a lot of family in the U.S. now, and now they're starting to come up because it's, you know, a they didn't they didn't you know obviously their passports is one big problem renewing it. Second is we we they couldn't come in. Now they're coming in. Hey, we bring all the family we can through. Let's come on in before something else happens and they got to shut down the border again. You know, nuts. Oh no, my man. That's why I, I say know, it's man. crazy times. You know, we hope we hope that it's status quo, but you don't know. Right. I know. I know. And if that's the case, it means everybody will be home watching us all over again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know, but see, you've already. What are you gonna do? You've already got your. You already digitalized all your old stuff. Now, what would you do? Just be on Twitch and yeah. be and be making and be making the sh and and then just doing the shows. I, mean, I don't know what yeah. else I could do. No, the shows. I mean, I'm telling you, I think the shows are gonna be the shows are a hit. Obviously, I think I could see that. You know, getting into a like you're creating this true house stories book. And every episode is a chapter in that book. And you're writing it like all the, the just the lyrics of that book. And it's, of course, man, I, that, I would think you should be doing that. We shall see. Time will tell. Of course, man. Time Lenny, this has been amazing, man. I, I really want to thank you for coming on board tonight and, and, and sharing and talking and just, you know, this is new to me, man. So like you're, you're a veteran at this and you're great at this to have a one question type of, you know, show. And, and I'm trying to, and I'm like, I'm, I spent, I spent 20 hours working out 
you know, what can we talk about? What can I talk about? I go to my wife. What am I? What am I going to tell this guy? I don't even know what to say to this guy. You know, it's just, and she's like, just, just fucking be yourself, man. Just talk about, just you and you and and Lenny share same bit like the the passion for music, the DJing, and ask him what what you know all about his stuff back in New York City. So this is this has been great. I mean, like we shot the shit for for you know two hours, and it's been awesome, awesome. Did you catch everything you needed from me? You know what? I, it doesn't matter. This is your it. What we talked about, like, because I knew we were gonna veer off, and it's like your story is your journey is far where it, it, it's that's where I wanted to go with, and it, and yeah, we didn't talk about some things, but I'm not worried about it because we got everything. I mean, I I found out things about you and about the the music and and the 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 tracks you've created back in the eighties and late nineties and early nineties that you brought back. Now I'm going to go get them. I have to go get them now. Cause I love it. I love your music. I love your style. And I think, um, I think that it doesn't matter what age you are. Um, the young us guys, we're probably the same age in our fifties, early fifties. And it's like the, that music will never die. Man will never die. Never, never. Never die. As I'm gone, it'll be here in infamy. <laughs> You're absolutely right, man. My man, DJ Dave, thank you so much. I appreciate the offer. Lenny, I and appreciate I you. Say to you. I would say it to you as congratulations on your show. Keep thank going. You. And thank I you wish so much. you all the best. Oh man, that's me telling you. I wish you all the best, man. This is this has been great. This has been fantastic. Lenny, thank you so much. And I and I wish you nothing but huge success in your in in the days to come, the gigs, your your true house stories, and uh and you coming up to Toronto and us hanging out, having some drinks and, oh, we will. and, and we'll you know do it. we'll make that happen, man. Make that happen for we sure. Will. I'll be back before you know it. Awesome, buddy. Hey, care, everyone. Buddy. Thank you again. You can catch you on TrueHouseStories.com on Wednesdays. 2 p.m. New York City time, 7 p.m. UK time. <laughs> Love that, man. Buddy, thank you so much, Lenny. Have a good night. Everyone All the best, buddy. Around the Take world. Care. Thank you again, brother. Ciao, buddy. Ciao.